In our look at the Minor Prophets, we've come up to the third from the last, Haggai. Haggai is a very short book. In fact, it's the second shortest book of the Old Testament. And Haggai is the first of what we would call the post-exilic prophets. By that, we mean these are the prophets that spoke to Israel after they were returning from their time in exile. Let me show you what I mean. We're going to look at our timeline that we've been looking at before. And the dates that we're talking about right now are the dates below that red line. The red line is when Judah had been defeated by Babylon and taken into captivity. And uh, you'll see those prophets there below the red line. Jeremiah, um, we see his name as well above the red line. When the people were carried into exile, Jeremiah was given the option to go to Babylon or to remain in Judah. And he remained in Judah for a time. Against his will, he was carried off to Egypt and uh, then came back again. But um, he was prophesying there. But you see those three prophets there at the bottom, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, that are ministering to the Israelites as they're returning from the exile. In fact, Haggai and Zechariah actually uh, prophesy and minister together. In the book of Ezra, their names are joined together. It says Haggai and Zechariah. So both of them uh, come to uh, speak to the people at the same time. As I mentioned, this is a short book, um, not only in the number of verses, but even the ministry of Haggai spans only about four or five months. He is very specific in his dates, telling us exactly when he was delivering these prophecies. And so that's how we know that it covers such a short period of time. But boy, oh boy, it might be short, but this book is just, it shines brightly. (laughs) And uh, there's a lot of stuff for us to unpack here. Now, before we start looking at this message that Haggai has delivered to us, I need to do just a really brief grammar lesson uh, so that you understand what we're talking about today. And it's two words or two prefixes, actually, un and non, U-N and N-O-N. Now, I know ultimately both of those mean not, but the way that we're going to look at them, we need to make sure that we're we're very certain on uh, the specific preposition that we're using there. When I say something is unbiblical, yes, that means not biblical, but specifically and very specifically what it means is something contrary to what the Bible says. So if we say something is unbiblical, that means that the Bible says one thing, but this unbiblical statement is completely contrary to that. When we say non-biblical, what we're saying is that it isn't specifically in the Bible. That statement, that non-biblical thought or statement might be correct or it might be incorrect, but we just can't go to the Bible and say, well, here's our final authority from the Bible that says this is correct. Now, the reason why I want to make sure that we understand those terms is because obviously unbiblical things are sinful because they are contrary to what God says. Non-biblical things aren't necessarily sinful things. But if our focus becomes on non-biblical things, if we don't have a biblical basis or a foundation for what we're saying or what we're believing, then that can begin to slide into unbiblical things. And that's where we'll really start to have a problem. Let me give you an example that I shared in my book, Shepherd Leadership. I talk about a friend of mine, a youth pastor, that came in to me one day and said, hey, uh, do you prefer to be called the lead pastor or the senior pastor? And I sort of looked at him and I'm like, well, that's sort of an odd question. And he explained that he had just been in a meeting in his church where there was a lengthy discussion. They were Uh, reviewing sort of the flow chart of how things uh, went in their church governance. And there was kind of a little bit of a debate of, do we call our head pastor? He's the senior pastor. Is he the lead pastor? He said, so what do you think? And I said, well, what does it say in the Bible? And he says, well, it doesn't, that's, that title isn't there. And I said, you're right. So it's a non-biblical thing. I said, but if you want to go a little bit farther, The word pastor technically isn't in the Bible either. That's an English word that we put in there. But the Greek word that we translate that from means herdsman or it means shepherd. 
And so that's the idea of, you know, somebody looking out for a group of people. And so we've now given them the title pastor. But here's my concern, is that if we begin to focus on things that are non-biblical and we begin to give them such a priority that they become more and more of our focus and more and more of our energy goes to these non-biblical things, we are in real danger of that non-biblical thing, which could be sort of neutral, becoming an unbiblical thing, which is not anything close to neutral. It's grievous to the heart of God. In fact, here's what I wrote. Let me read you a section from the preface of my book, Shepherd Leadership, where I talked about this. Here's what I said. My larger concern is that churches, parachurch organizations, and nonprofit ministries that are largely founded to fulfill a biblical mandate are straying from the simple, freeing truths found in the Bible. Or maybe I should say, that they are adding things to their ministries that aren't in the pages of Scripture. In other words, non-biblical things. Whichever way you want to say it, the result is the same. We're using the wrong metrics to define success for our ministries. And so what happens is that we begin to focus on things that God says, that's not where your focus is supposed to be. This is what Jesus took the religious leaders in his day to task for. In Matthew chapter 15, They came to him with this question. They said, why do your disciples break the tradition? Notice that word, the tradition of our elders. In other words, they said, we have something that we do that is non-biblical. In this particular case, they were talking about hand washing before you eat food. Now, is there anything wrong with washing your hands? Of course not. There's There's nothing wrong about that. But they made this tradition They elevated it. And so Jesus answers their question with a question of his own. And he says, you know, I'm looking at some of your other traditions. And some of your other traditions are resulting in violating God's law. These non-biblical things have now become unbiblical things. And here's his conclusion to them in Matthew chapter 15, verse 6. He says this, thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your traditions. For the sake of your non-biblical things, you become so focused on the non-biblical things that they've now become unbiblical things. They've become now contrary to Scripture. Now, the reason why I bring that up is because in the the book of Haggai, we're going to see this same thing. As I mentioned to you, it's a very short book. It's only 38 verses long. But 28 times, catch this, 28 times, In just 38 verses, Haggai says something that really amounts to, this is what God says. You can go through here and find all these phrases like, this is the word of the Lord. The Lord Almighty says, when God spoke. And and you'll find those phrases 28 times in 38 verses. Do you kind of get the emphasis here that what Haggai is saying is, let's be really sure that what we're doing is, lines up with what God has told us. Let's get back to the Bible. Let's get back to the Scripture. Let's get back to God's Word and make sure that we understand this. Now, I mentioned earlier uh, Ezra, that uh, Haggai, Haggai and Zechariah both show up. Ezra is one of the historical books in the Bible, and he was a priest that was helping to Um, bring the exiles back to Jerusalem, and then rebuild not only the city of Jerusalem, but specifically rebuild the temple. And um, Haggai and Zechariah show up at a very pivotal time because the people had become um, distracted and intimidated and had really bailed on the work. They were no longer rebuilding the temple. Instead, they were focused on their own things. And so I think that when we start focusing on non-biblical things— I think that there are four things that can come up that are dangers because we're um, focused on something that is, in our own minds, a good thing, but it doesn't necessarily line up with God's Word. So it might be something non-biblical, but it's still we can't find a basis for it in God's Word. So let me just share with you those four things that we need to watch out for. Number one um, is that we see it in chapter 1, verse 4 of Haggai, that our desires— what we want to do for ourselves become a priority over what God has told us to do. So the people came back to uh, Jerusalem, and they were supposed to be working on the temple. But in chapter 1, verse 4, it says, Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your 
paneled houses, while this house, speaking of the temple, remains a ruin. So in other words, they're saying, um, well, we started building, but you know what? I, I, I just got to take care of me first. Let, let me get my house in order. Let me get a place where I'm comfortable first. I mean, who could fault me for that? And, and then I'll get back to work on this thing. Right? And the priority now has shifted because from what God says to my desire. And we've got to be very careful of that. The second thing is they became very easily intimidated. Let me take you this time to the book of Ezra. And I want to read a couple of verses for you. This is after they started rebuilding the temple. Ezra reports this, then the peoples around them. So these are the non-Israelite people in the community surrounding them. The peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They hired counselors to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. At the beginning of the reign of Xerxes, they lodged an accusation against the people of Judah and Jerusalem. And then Ezra goes on to report the letter that they wrote, basically saying, um, we're, we're going to fabricate something. We're going to make what you're doing here, this work on the temple, we're going to make it sound like it's something bad, and we're going to send a bad report back to the king. And the people um, got intimidated by that, and they stopped working. And which kind of fueled in back to that first thing, well, since we can't work on the temple, let's go work on our own houses again. But it's because they weren't listening to God's word. Now, let's come back to Haggai. Haggai, there's a third thing here. The people, I think, lack stick to the perseverance. They, they, um, they throw in the towel way too quickly. Haggai said in, in chapter 2, verse 3, who of you is less left who saw this house, again, speaking of the temple, in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? So these people that had been in Jerusalem and had seen the temple before it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar's army, and now they're back and they're starting to rebuild it, and people are going, eh, this doesn't really seem like a, doesn't seem like it's going to be very impressive. Uh, maybe, um, somebody else can handle it. And and they just walked away from it. It didn't seem like it was going to be anything substantial. And so they decided not to get involved with it. But again, they weren't re- they were forgetting to go back to what God had said to them. And then the fourth thing that we see, there's a phrase that shows up a couple of times, five times in fact in these short 38 verses where God says to give careful thought to what he was saying. Give careful thought to your surroundings in light of what God uh, and his word is saying. And I think that the fourth danger when we are non-biblical in our thinking is that we lose the ability to think things through the way that God would have us think things through. Because we're trying to come up with the answers instead of going to the Bible and getting God's word on it. So those are four things that you'll see in the lives of people if they start off with this or slide into this idea of being non-biblical. They're doing things that seem right to them. Well, when they when it seems right to them, my priorities trump God's priorities. I become intimidated and I uh, real quickly by people that oppose me. I lack stick to itiveness. I can't stick with something because I don't have the the hope and the encouragement that comes from God's word. And then I lose the ability to kind of think things through, like, how would God think about this? Or we use that phrase sometimes, WWJD, what would Jesus do? I, I really don't know how to think about what Jesus would do here because I'm not thinking biblically. And so th- this whole book of Haggai is really a call back to this idea of making sure that everything that we do, everything that we're thinking about, the the very heartbeat of our life is all coming from God's word. Now, I mentioned that phrase, give careful thought. Five times it shows up. And and every one of these times, it's always very closely tied to one of those phrases of this is what God says. So Haggai says, listen to what God says, and now think about that in light of the situation that you're in or the decision that you need to make or the way that you're currently living. Don't, don't think about it like, 
how do I feel about this? How do I think about this? But what does God say about it? And then what am I doing? Let me let me show you these examples here. And by the way, this phrase to give when when he says here in Haggai, give careful thought to this, that phrase literally means to grab a hold of something, like just hold on to it really closely and and look at it from every angle. Give it a level of an intensity, not just kind of a you know, oh, it's a thought that just passed through my mind. No, it's a thought that I grabbed a hold of and I looked at it from every angle through what lens? Through the lens of God's word. What does God say about this? Why am I thinking this? I'm, I'm looking at this thing. So look at, um, here's what it says right here. The first time that we see this phrase show up, like I said, it's always tied to this is what God says. So chapter one, verse five, now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Okay, so in light of what God is saying, let me grab a hold of this and and give this some thought. And verse number seven, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Okay, twice now here in just a couple of verses separated from each other. Listen to what God says and then give careful thought to your ways. Go to chapter two, verse 15. Well, verse 14. Uh, he says, so this is what's happening, and it says, declares the Lord. So God says this, and then the, the thought just continues on. Now give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider these things. Okay, so here's what God says. Now, now that I've heard that from this day on, give careful thought, grab a hold of that, and consider it. Verse number 17, again, God's speaking, and, and Haggai writes, declares the Lord. And then he goes on and says, from this day on, give careful thought to the day. Give careful thought to this. And then he gives another phrase to, to have people um, ponder. And so the idea is to take what God says and use that to then evaluate the thoughts that we have. The Apostle Paul shared that same counsel with us in the book of 2 Corinthians. Look at this. We demolish arguments and every pretension. I like that word pretension there that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought. That's like the same phrase of give careful thought. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Okay, now there's you can see the tie-in between what Paul said there and the, the direct echoes from the prophet Haggai. So we take every thought that has this pretense of being something good, but before we let that thought go too far, we give careful thought to it. We grab a hold of it, and we say, what does God say about this? Or as the way Paul says it, we make that thought obedient to Christ. So in other words, we say, is this something that Jesus would think? Is this something that Jesus would do? Is this how Jesus would act? Is this what God has told me in the, the word that I'm supposed to live this way, talk this way, think this way? And if not, then I need to not dwell on that thought anymore. I need to get rid of that one. Now, again, let me caution you. That thought might not be a sinful thought. It might simply be non-biblical. Okay, so it's neither necessarily right or wrong. The Bible doesn't say anything about it one way or the other. Okay, but if our non biblical thoughts keep on accumulating and our biblical thoughts keep decreasing, what happens over time? Who do we turn to for answers? Well, me, because I'm the one coming up with these non biblical thoughts, and if I'm not careful, they can become unbiblical thoughts, those sinful thoughts that are leading me down a path farther and farther away from God's design for my life. So Jesus had to address this a couple of times, and it wasn't sinful people. It wasn't ungodly people that he talked to. It was God-fearing people that he had to remind them about going back to God's word. Look what he said to the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day. He said this, Jesus replied to them, you are wrong for two reasons, because you know neither the scriptures, you don't have the scriptures in mind, nor God's power. He said they were coming up with this scenario, 
And they were saying, well, what about and what if and how it, would it happen like this? And what do you think? And he says, you know, you're coming up with a scenario that you're not even going back to God's word. If you were to go to God's word on this, you would understand that that is a really bad question that you're asking. It's a really bad line of thought that you're on because it you're not lining it up with God's word. Okay, Even talking to his own disciples. Now, remember, his disciples, after Jesus was crucified, they locked themselves away. They were distraught. They didn't know what to do. Even on resurrection morning, when people came and told them Jesus is alive, um, some of the women said, we've even seen him. Peter and John ran to the tomb and they saw the tomb empty. They're still all kind of like, what does this mean? We don't get this. We, what What is exactly happening here? And so to his own followers, Jesus had to bring them back to the scriptures. So look at Luke chapter 24. He's talking to a couple of guys walking along the road, and he says this. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. In other words, God's word. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then look what he does. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And then when he spoke to his other followers, he said, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then I love this last sentence. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. The New Testament is filled with with this reminder for us to go back to the scriptures. Explicitly, the phrase, it is written, is 75 times in the New Testament. 75 times throughout the New Testament. Specifically, it tells us it is written. What we're telling you is what came from the Old Testament scripture. But but that's not even beginning to scratch the surface. Let's just take the Gospel of Matthew alone. The Gospel of Matthew has nearly a hundred times that it says what Jesus did was to fulfill what took place or what was spoken about him in the Old Testament. That's what we just read from Luke chapter 24. He said all of these things, I had to fulfill all of these things from every part of the Scripture. And so the New Testament admonishes us just as much as Haggai does to go back to the Scripture, go back to the Word of God again and again and again. So let me give you three thoughts in uh, just wrapping this up. Number one, you've got to hear the Word of God. you got to read it. Uh, One of the nicest compliments that I've ever received, uh, and I've heard this a handful of times from people, is when they've said, your sermons make me want to go and read the Bible more. Uh, Friends, I can't tell you how thrilled I am to hear that. I I love the fact that people want to go and dig into God's Word. Listen, don't let Sunday morning be the only time that you crack your Bible open and hear what the pastor is saying. I I want you to get into God's Word. You've got to hear His Word all the time. So um, you can read it out of a book if that works for you. Um, I love the uh, app on my phone called YouVersion. And uh, there are different reading plans that you can get in there, a little checkmark calendar that will keep you on track reading through God's Word. But you have to hear the Word. Get the Word in to your own heart and mind. But then secondly, this is what I need you to do after you hear the Word, is that you need to think about it. That's what Haggai said all the time. Give careful thought. Think about this. Now, here's how I want you to evaluate it. Number one when, when you have heard the word, say, from a pastor, somebody else has spoken a word to you, I want you to think about it the way that these people that lived in the city of Berea did. Here's what uh, Luke records for us in Acts chapter 17. Now, the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and here's the phrase, and examine the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So they heard a pastor, Paul, speak the word of God to them, but then they went to the word for themselves and said, is that really what it says? Is his interpretation of that really accurate? 
Now, friends, we, we have, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit inside you. Think about this for a second. The Holy Spirit that inspired, say, in the this book that we're looking at right now, Haggai, the same Holy Spirit that inspired Haggai to pen these words is the same Holy Spirit in you that can help you illuminate those words and understand those words and weigh those words. So you need to listen. When when somebody else shares a word, this is how you weigh it. You go back to the scripture. You don't say, hmm, well, that seems to contradict what another pastor said. No, don't, don't do that. Go back to what the Bible says. But then for yourself, you need to weigh it the way that David did. I love this closing prayer that he prays in Psalm 139. Search me, God, know my heart, test me, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So when I hear the word, I need to consider it. I need to weigh it. I need to wrestle with it and say, okay, now that that word is spoken to me, is there something I need to change? Is, is the Holy Spirit convicting me of something that I need to do different? Not what seems good to me, what, what idea am I coming up with, but what is God saying to me? So hear the word, consider the word, and thirdly, the most important thing, you've got to obey the word. You have to do what God lays on your heart to do. We're going to look at this in an upcoming message, but one of the great things about what Haggai spoke is the action that the people took place, uh, that uh, implemented in their lives after they heard this word and considered it, then they acted on it. Here's what Samuel said in 1 Samuel. What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than the offering of the fat of rams. God wants you to obey what he says to you. I want to wrap up by quoting to you a uh, portion of a sermon that, that uh, Charles Spurgeon delivered, where he too was challenging his congregation to get into the word, to hear the word, to consider the word, and to obey the word, to just be people of the word. Listen to what he said. I would quote John Bunyan as an instance of what I mean. Read anything of his, and you will see that it is almost like reading the Bible itself. He had read it till his very soul was saturated with Scripture. And though his writings are charmingly full of poetry, yet he cannot give, his, give us his Pilgrim's Progress, the sweetest of all prose poems, without continually making us feel and say, why, this man is a living Bible. And I love this phrase, prick him anywhere. Spurgeon says of Bunyan, prick him anywhere. His blood is bibbling. The very essence of the Bible flows from him. He cannot speak without quoting a text, for his very soul is full of the word of God. I commend his example to you, beloved. And to Charles Spurgeon's words, I can only say amen. Friends, I commend that example to you as well of John Bunyan, of Haggai, who just constantly keeps saying, let's go to the word. Let's go to the word. Hear what God says. Listen to what he says. Consider what he says. Weigh what he says. How do I need to apply this to my life? And then obey what he says. Read the word. Consider the word. Obey the word. Friends, let's not be non-biblical in our lifestyle, and our thinking. And certainly, certainly, we don't want to become unbiblical. But we want to listen to God's word and give careful thought. Grab a hold of it. Make those thoughts obedient to Christ and then make our lifestyle obedient to that word that he's spoken to us. Let's do this. Let's be people of the word of God. God bless you, friends. I love you.